Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is kind of a crazy one, not necessarily because of what happened, though that aspect of this case is quite bizarre, but because of all of the twists and turns this case takes us through. Just when you think we found a resolution to this case, there's even more. So, without any delay, let's just jump right into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the death of Anna Marie Cochran. Anna Marie Cochran was born on July 30th, 1972 in Springfield, Connecticut. Growing up, Anna Marie was always known as being kind with a huge heart. She loved animals, especially dogs, growing up with a Shih Tzu named Snuggles and a Poodle named Charlie. She also loved music and was known for going out of her way to make people laugh. When she was little, she wanted to be a veterinarian to help animals, but eventually she decided that she wanted to help people instead. She went to Cathedral High School before she graduated and went on to attend paramedic school in Granby, Connecticut. After finishing school, she went on to work as a paramedic at American Medical Response Ambulance Medical Services, working in Springfield and Holyoke. Anna Marie was known for having a passion for helping others, going above and beyond what was expected of her at her job. When driving the ambulance, she would stop and provide lunches for the homeless. In the colder months, she would offer rides to the homeless to different shelters to ensure that they could be warm. As an adult, Anna Marie was known to enjoy driving, she loved her car, and never went a day without washing her car. She loved traveling as well, spending her winters in Florida to get away from the cold weather. She loved going on cruises and had dreams of someday swimming with the dolphins. She loved photography, scuba diving, and golf as well. When Anna Marie was 16 years old, she was caught by an uncle having relations with another woman. At the time, she was pretty much forced to come out as a lesbian. Her family was surprised, but reportedly, they all supported her after that. Back in December of 2002, Anna Marie started dating Kara Rintalis, who was seven years older than Anna Marie, and she also worked as a paramedic. She worked at Ludlow Fire Department. While Anna Marie was known to be outgoing and vivacious, Kara was known to be a bit more reserved. They were an unlikely duo, but they were in love. By August of 2005, the couple were married, adopting their newborn daughter, Brianna, by 2007. The couple would end up living together in a home in Granby, Connecticut. By March 28, 2010, Anna Marie had worked an overnight shift in Springfield. While Anna Marie was working, Kara spent her time at home. That evening, Kara received a text from a friend named Mike, who went over to the home with a six-pack of beer in hand. So, Kara texted Anna Marie, letting her know that Mike was visiting. But Anna Marie did not take this news well. In fact, she was enraged at the fact that a male friend was visiting. She responded to the text saying, quote, It is becoming very clear how you feel about me. I don't like feeling this way. You are my wife. I hate the relationship we have. To this, Kara responded, Okay, you're being over the top and crazy for no reason. It's okay. He's my friend. Period. Not doing anything wrong. Anna Marie responded to this saying, You are rude. I'm gonna leave. You don't give a shit. You are rude and disrespectful. After this heated text conversation, Anna Marie went on to work her shift as normal. And after her 12-hour shift by 8 a.m., now going into March 29th, 2010, Anna Marie returned home. By 9.30 a.m., Anna Marie called her father and spoke with him for a bit. Shortly after Anna Marie returned home, Kara got a call from the Lodlow Fire Department asking her to come in because apparently they needed somebody to work a shift, so she went. But a few hours later, it was found that she wasn't actually needed all day, so by 10 or 11 a.m., she clocked out of work and returned home. Later that day at around 3 p.m., Kara left home with Brianna and the two ran errands. They were out for about five hours before returning home around 7 p.m. However, when Kara got home, she called out to Anna Marie, but she didn't answer. Then she noticed that the door leading to the basement was opened, so she looked down the stairs 
and she actually saw that Anna Marie's feet were lying on the bottom of the stairs. This immediately concerned Kara, so she grabbed Brianna and their dog and quickly ran to a neighbor's house asking him to watch the toddler and their dog as well as call 911 before Kara rushed back home. The neighbor did call police who responded less than five minutes later. When first responders arrived, they entered the home, went into the kitchen, and saw that the basement door was open. At that same time, he could hear a woman yelling from the basement. So, they went to the basement and saw Kara sitting on the basement floor with Anna Marie's lifeless body across her lap. Anna Marie's face was so puffy that the officer, who knew Anna Marie because of her job, didn't even recognize her at first. First responders described that Kara was hysterical at this point. They had to pry Kara away from Anna Marie's body. And when they did so, they realized that Anna Marie was stiff as a board and her skin was ice cold. When they moved Anna Marie's body, she moved as one unit, almost like a very stiff piece of cardboard. She was so swollen and puffy at that point that her body weighed almost 200 pounds at that point, which was a lot more than she actually weighed. This extra weight was due to edema and basically the natural processes that your body go through after you are deceased. It was clear to first responders at that point that rigor mortis had kicked in hours before she had been found. But what made the scene very bizarre was the fact that both Anna Marie and Kara had paint on them. So, Anna Marie's body was pretty much completely covered in wet paint and Kara had streaks of paint on her as well. Police found an overturned five-gallon bucket with paint spilling out of it right next to Anna Marie's body. The paint had seeped beneath Anna Marie's thighs as well, and then mixed in with the paint, there were puddles of blood around Anna Marie's body as well. When first responders saw this paint, they described it as mostly white with pink tinges, and it was still very shiny and wet looking. When paramedics got her body removed from the scene, police took Kara back upstairs and sat her down at the kitchen table for some initial questioning. The officer asked her what happened, and through tears, she told them that her and Anna Marie had been arguing, so both her her and her wife were still upset with one another that day. She left to cool down while running some errands, bringing Brianna with her, while Anna Marie got some time to herself to spend at home in the peace and quiet and to get a nap after working her 12-hour shift. She said that when she got home, she saw Anna Marie's body at the bottom of the stairs, so again, she rushed Brianna and their dog over to the neighbor's house and called 911. When she returned back to the home, she said that she rushed downstairs to Anna Marie, who was face down at that point. So she was face down when she found her. She said that she flipped her body over to face her up so that she could lie her in her lap. She said that when she found Anna Marie, she was already covered in paint. Immediately, Kara suggested to police that maybe Anna Marie tripped and fell down the stairs acknowledging that things didn't look good and that she knew she was a suspect. After that, Kara asked officers if she could wash herself and change her clothes before going to the station, which the first officer did allow. One officer watched her as she washed her hands and face, and as she was doing so, her nose started to bleed just a little bit. But as Kara was about to grab a fresh set of clothes, another officer stepped in to tell them that Kara was not to touch anything else. So, they complied. Officers then took Kara into the police station for further questioning. As that was happening, detectives arrived to the scene to start investigating. Initially, it was clear that Anna Marie had bruises all over her body, but obviously, it was too early to tell exactly how she had died. So, her body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. According to the medical examiner, Anna Marie had a total of 23 bruises across her arms, legs, and back. She also had blunt force injuries to her head and scalp, determining that these injuries were the result of blunt force trauma, most likely from being struck with a blunt weapon or from her head and body hitting against a blunt surface. It was possible that these injuries were caused from either falling or being pushed down the stairs. But what was especially concerning was that the medical examiner also found abrasions across Anna Marie's chin and along the front of her neck. This bruising was consistent with manual strangulation. 
the medical examiner said that the official cause of death was the result of manual strangulation. A toxicology test came back and they found that there was no drugs or alcohol in her system. The medical examiner then estimated that Anna Marie's time of death was sometime between 11.15 a.m. and 1.15 a.m., though she did note that the time of death could not be determined with 100% accuracy. Now, I do want to note that in the initial report the medical examiner gave, she said that the time of death could not be determined, but she later changed the report and gave that 11.15 to 1.15 time frame. She did also say that she could have been dead for up to 12 hours before she was found. So again, the time of death was an estimate and couldn't be concretely determined with 100% accuracy. The medical examiner's explanation basically was that Anna Marie was hit with some sort of object or she fell down the stairs or something like that. Basically, she was injured in some way that would render her unconscious or she would have been dazed enough at that point that strangling her would have been a lot easier. So again, she thinks that she was hit, either was unconscious or dazed, and then was strangled after that. And that is what officially killed her. Now, six hours after the discovery of Anna Marie's lifeless body, Kara sat down for a police interview at the station. In the interview, she had periods of being very calm and periods of being absolutely hysterical. She started by giving a timeline of events from the hours leading to finding her wife's body. Kara said that Anna Marie was mad at her about spending some time with a male friend of theirs. She said that the two would fight sometimes and that their relationship wasn't in the best spot at the time. Then she discussed the timeline that I mentioned earlier, from the time that Anna Marie got home to when Kara left for errands before coming home and finding her body. But pretty much immediately in the interview, she started talking about the troubles that she had in her relationship. She told the officer that she loved Anna Marie, but that she had a temper and this created a lot of tension in the home. She said that Anna Marie was always in her space, threatening her and saying mean things. She said that she was a very hurtful person. She said that the two got into arguments all the time, but never knew how to resolve them. She said that Anna Marie was a very loud, confrontational person who got in her face and bullied her. She said that Anna Marie was often jealous of any relationship that she had with friends or basically anybody that wasn't her. She then started to talk about how Anna Marie was very irresponsible with her spending. She opened a credit card in her name and took out a $25,000 loan in Kara's name. Then she withdrew all of the money from Brianna's savings account. She said that she didn't think that Anna Marie had a drug or gambling problem. She was just a very severe shopaholic. She said that Anna Marie told her that some of the stolen money was used to pay off a college loan, which she believed at the time. So Kara said that she never pressed charges with the money things because she didn't want Brianna to see her mother in jail. She said that she did forgive Anna Marie for what she did with stealing all of this money but she will never forget it. She also called Anna Marie a master manipulator and a bully. Throughout the interview, Carol would stop to say that she still loved Anna Marie, saying that she felt like she was betraying her by saying all of these things about her. She said that she felt terrible for saying anything negative about her. But then she would go right back to saying that she was a bully and that she made the house a very miserable place to live. Then she said that by September of 2008, their already tumultuous relationship turned physically violent. Police were called at that time with Anna Marie claiming that Kara hit her with a spatula and then a closed fist. They apparently said that this bad argument was over a grilled cheese, which would make sense with the spatula being involved. But Kara said that this argument was purely verbal. So when police initially responded, she said that it was purely verbal. At the time, police did arrest Kara, but then she confided to officers that Anna Marie actually assaulted her and showed them a red mark that she had on her neck. At that point, Anna Marie filed a restraining order against Kara, but a month later, it was dropped. A few months later, on May 12th, 2009, police received another call from their home. 
In that first call, the dispatcher reported that all he heard on the other end was screaming, with someone yelling, just leave, just leave. Then someone picked up the phone, saying that their daughter accidentally dialed 911. After that, on May 26th, 911 received another call from Kara. In this call, she was hysterical, saying, she's threatening to take my daughter from me. I'm being threatened. I can't get a hold of my lawyers. Then she said, I need help. That same day, both women appeared in court to request restraining orders against the other, both also requesting custody of their then two-year-old daughter, Brianna. At the time, Kara was still hysterical, saying that Anna Marie is constantly threatening her, saying that she's going to take away her livelihood, her home, and her daughter. She then said that she is afraid to be in her own home with Anna Marie. However, in that case, the judge ordered that the two women learn to live together in peace or that criminal charges would be placed against the both of them and Brianna would be taken away. The judge said, quote, you're going to have to deal with it. I don't think either of you are stable enough to be parents. I am this close to filing criminal charges against both of you. And if I ever see you in my court again, I'll be on the phone with the Department of Children and Families so fast that they'll be here before you get out of the door. By June of that year, the couple filed for divorce. It was also the same time that Anna Marie started a new relationship with a woman named Carla, moving in with Carla by August of that year. But apparently, Anna Marie spent $10,000 on Carla's credit card, so she left and moved back in with Kara. After that, the couple withdrew their petition for divorce. Those who knew the couple said that after trying to get things back on track and trying to reconcile, they just continued arguing. Even though Anna Marie had maxed out multiple credit cards, took out a bunch of debt, and had no business spending money, about a month before her death, the couple went to Florida to visit Anna Marie's aunt, and then the couple went on a cruise to the Caribbean together as well. While visiting the aunt, the aunt said that it was clear that Kara was over the relationship. At one point, she said, I can't take it anymore. I want a divorce. Now, I know I got a little bit off of track from the police interview, but pretty much all of that was discussed throughout the interview with Kara, so I added in some supporting information so that I didn't have to go back over it later, didn't want to be redundant, I just wanted to go over it now. Either way, near the end of the police interview, police asked Kara, so what do you think happened? And Kara got really frustrated. She said, I don't know, I don't know. I feel like you're pointing your questions at me, like I had something to do with it. To which the officer replied, you're the one who said you'd been fighting all day. Kara then leaned forward on the table, head in her hands, and yelled, God, God damn, I wish my head would fall off. When asked again about what she thought happened, she said she didn't know. Maybe Anna Marie fell down the stairs. It was probably an accident. But the officer pointed out that Anna Marie wasn't found close enough to the stairs to show that she fell down. He also asked where the paint came from. Once again, Kara got frustrated, saying that she didn't know. She said that she had no support and really felt like the finger was being pointed squarely at her. After that, the interview pretty much ended and she wouldn't talk with investigators again without an attorney present. So clearly, we can see that this couple had a very rough relationship. Things were never really calm for them, and there was obviously a lot of tension there. So, based on what was found at the scene, Kara definitely looked suspicious. Now, as police continued with their investigation, they also went ahead and put together a timeline of the day leading to Anna Marie's death. They were able to use cell phone data as well as surveillance footage to put together their timeline. As we know, by 8 p.m. on March 28th, Anna Marie started her 12-hour shift. During that time, Kara and Anna Marie were angrily texting back and forth about Kara hanging out with that guy friend. Then, by 8 a.m. on March 29th, Anna Marie returned home. By 9.30 a.m., Anna Marie called her father and spoke with him, and at around the same time, until around 11, Kara left for work for a few hours of overtime at her job, as we discussed earlier. By 12.21 p.m., a call was placed from Anna Marie's phone to her aunt in Florida, who I briefly mentioned a minute ago. That was the last outgoing activity recorded on Anna Marie's phone. However, throughout the rest of the day, Anna Marie was receiving numerous calls and text messages from multiple friends, as well as from Kara, 
all of which went unanswered. By around 3 p.m., Kara reportedly left the house with Brianna. She said that she left Anna Marie so that she could get some sleep before returning to work for another shift that was scheduled for 8 p.m. that same day. Just before 5 p.m., she was seen on surveillance footage at the Holyoke Mall, shopping at the Children's Place and The Gap, where she bought a t-shirt and some socks, respectively. While at the mall, Kara texted Anna Marie a few times. By 5.47 p.m., Kara is seen driving into a McDonald's parking lot, circling around the lot for a few minutes before she got out of her truck and is seen throwing several items into a trash can at the back of the lot. After that, she drove away without stopping to get food from McDonald's. Now, just to pause, police did later go to that trash can at the McDonald's to look through it and see if they could find what Kara threw in there, and they actually found several cleaning rags, one of which had a faint blood stain on it. Unfortunately, though, the DNA on that rag was too deteriorated at that point to make a positive match or to even determine if it was human blood. After driving away from McDonald's 10 minutes later at 5.57 p.m., she stopped at a stop and shop supermarket. At that point, Kara called Anna Marie a few times, but she still wasn't getting an answer. Her truck was captured on surveillance video, and investigators noticed that there was a laundry basket and a red bag in the bed of her truck. By 6.19 p.m., Kara left Stop and Shop and headed to Burger King, located about five miles away from their home in Granby. There, she actually did buy dinner for herself and Brianna. On the Burger King surveillance video, you could still see the laundry basket and red bag in the back of her truck. But by the time Kara arrived home, those items were no longer in the truck and they have not been found to this day. Then, as we know, a frantic Kara arrives to a neighbor's house at 7.12 p.m. This neighbor was a 65-year-old self-employed flooring installer named Roy. According to Roy, when Kara knocked on his door, he and his wife had been watching the Wheel of Fortune. When he answered, she had Brianna in her arms and immediately handed her over to him. She was frantic, yelling, call 911, and in the basement, before turning around and running home. Now at this point, after learning all of this information, it was very clear that Kara may have had something to do with her wife's death. The medical examiner did rule her death as a homicide. The timeline that Kara gave didn't exactly line up when with the medical examiner determined she died, and that surveillance footage doesn't look great either. But after this initial investigation, things slowed down. A few months after Anna Marie's death, Kara sold their home and moved with Brianna to Rhode Island, which is where her mother and stepfather lived. More time passed without an arrest and people in the community had no idea why. Now, at the time, the county's district attorney was a woman who was a staunch supporter of same-sex marriage. Rumors started to spread that maybe she was dragging her feet on the arrest because she didn't want to charge a woman with the murder of her wife. But a year and a half after the murder, a new DA took office, Dave Sullivan. He said that the case wasn't as solid as people would want to think. It was a very circumstantial case, so they had to be cautious with how they went about it. So that could have actually been why there wasn't an arrest initially. But nevertheless, by October of 2011, a Hampshire County grand jury did indict Kara on a charge of first-degree murder, and she was arrested in Rhode Island before being extradited back to Massachusetts. By February of 2013, Kara finally went to trial for the first-degree murder of her wife, Anna Marie. The prosecution argued that the relationship between Anna Marie and Kara had been turbulent for quite some time. They had multiple interactions with police and the courts saying that there had been domestic abuse in the relationship. Anna Marie was a reckless spender who took from savings, took out fraudulent loans and fraudulent credit cards in Kara's name and landed the couple in a combined $30,000 worth of debt. The prosecution said that they actually found two other exes of Kara who said that she was abusive towards them as well. He said that the two were fighting, with Anna Marie acting hysterical and jealous while she was texting Kara during her 12-hour shift. He said that once Anna Marie got home, they continued fighting until the mounting stress of their relationship finally caught up with Kara and she snapped. 
He said that she decided in that moment to end their marriage once and for all. Then, after killing her, she spilled paint all over her body and on the floors and picked her body up and put it on her lap, all to make the scene a lot harder to investigate. He then spoke about the physical evidence. When medics arrived to the scene, Anna Marie was covered in wet paint. Specifically, it was glidden ceiling paint, which is pink when it's applied, but it turns white when it dries. According to first responders, the paint was shiny and wet and still did look pink, which indicated that the paint had just been poured before they arrived. He talked about the surveillance footage, which showed Kara dumping something in a McDonald's trash can, only for investigators to find a cloth with blood on it in that same trash can. Then that laundry basket and that red bag had mysteriously disappeared. There's no reason for those items to have just disappeared, unless they were evidence that could be damning for Kara. He then said that according to the medical examiner's report, Anna Marie died as a result of homicide, again, sometime between 11 and 1 p.m. That meant that Anna Marie would have died an hour before Kara herself said that she left the house to run errands. The prosecution also pointed out how while she was running errands, she repeatedly called and texted Anna Marie, all without answer. She did this in an attempt to cover her tracks. She killed her wife, left, and then texted her to make it look like she was still alive. Then she returned home, poured paint on her to make it look like, you know, she spilled the paint or something when she was walking down the stairs, and then put her on her lap to stage the scene and so that it wasn't suspicious that she had blood on her and that, you know, there would be DNA all over her and things like that. Based on this, the prosecution argued that Kara killed her wife. She had the means, the motive, and the opportunity. It could not have been anybody else. However, the defense argued that yes, Kara should have been a suspect. Police were right in thinking that she could have had something to do with it, but they failed to consider other suspects. The defense specifically pointed out two alternative suspects. One suspect was a close friend of Anna Marie's. Now, it turned out that while Anna Marie was angrily texting Kara about her friend Mike visiting, Anna Marie had been texting with one of her co-workers slash male friends, Mark Oleksak. Her and Mark had been very close friends for quite some time, being friends for years at that point. But it seemed like maybe the two were getting too close. The two would try and schedule their work shifts to be at the same time so that they could spend more time together while working. They even had times where he would come over to their house while Kara was doing an overnight shift. While they were friends, there were times that Mark allowed Anna Marie to use three of his credit cards, and while doing so, Anna Marie ended up spending $6,000 of his money. Now, during the first trial, and I will get more into the number of trials in a bit, but Mark did not testify but during the second trial, he did. We ultimately found out that he was in love with Anna Marie, even though he was married. He did say that their friendship was only flirtatious, that they never had any sexual relations, but he said he did hope that it would turn sexual eventually. That kind of explains why he let her use his credit cards and run up a $6,000 debt. Either way, it turned out that during his first interview with police, Mark actually lied about where he was. He originally told the police that he was home all day on the day that Anna Marie was murdered, but it turns out that he had actually gone to several stores that day. He went to the bank in the early afternoon, he then went to Walmart to get sweatpants, then he went to a supermarket to buy cat litter. He did have a cat, and it turned out that when Anna Marie's body was found, there was a cat hair on her. Anna Marie and Kara hadn't owned a cat in at least nine months, so this hair could show that somebody who owned a cat or someone who had recent interactions with the cat was the one who committed the crime, aka Mark. However, I do just want to know that if you have a cat that sheds or even a dog that sheds, their hair can last forever. I had a cat like years and years and years ago. My dad still has the cat, but I haven't been around this cat in years. And there are times that I will randomly find a cat hair where there's no reason that there should be a cat hair in my room. It's, it's kind of hilarious, but it's also kind of crazy that these cat hairs just like stick around forever. So 
Either that's possible or maybe she saw Mark more recently than we know and the cat hair just happened to still be on her clothes or maybe it was just like debris, maybe it was like in the basement and it kind of just fell on her clothes at some point. There's so many other explanations for how that cat hair could have gotten on her. The other suspect that the defense pointed to was Carla, Anna Marie's ex who she lived with while temporarily separated from Kara. Like I said earlier, Anna Marie spent $10,000 on Carla's credit cards and broke up with her shortly after before moving back in with Kara. Obviously, Carla was very upset about all of the money that was spent, so this could have been a motive. The defense also said that in the pictures taken of the crime scene, the room is kind of dim, and in those pictures, the paint doesn't necessarily look pink. It's hard to tell what color it is, but to him, it's white, which again means that it had dried. As for the rag found in the McDonald's trash can, like I said earlier, the apparent bloodstain was so degraded that it couldn't even be confirmed whether or not it was human blood, let alone getting a DNA sample from it. The defense also said that while the prosecution claimed to have two exes of Kara's that say she was abusive, they weren't at trial to testify to that, so who even knows how accurate that statement even is? And to further that, if they wouldn't even show up to trial to talk about how abusive she was, she must not have been that abusive to the point that they felt that their testimony would have been helpful in getting a conviction. So, there is no concrete physical evidence to prove that Kara was ever abusive. The defense also questioned Anna Marie's time of death, saying that the medical examiner originally ruled that the time of death was undetermined, like I said, before going back and changing it to the time that she would ultimately list. The defense then brought forward their own medical examiner, Elizabeth Lepisoda. This medical examiner was a former Rhode Island medical examiner and now a professor of pathology and laboratory medicine at Brown University Medical School. She determined that Anna Marie's cause of death was actually sometime between 2.30 p.m. and 5.20 p.m., meaning that it was more likely that Kara was not home at the time that Anna Marie was killed. The defense closed by saying that there is not nearly enough evidence to say that Kara killed her wife beyond a reasonable doubt. The defense also said that it's not necessarily their job to prove that these other suspects could have been responsible only that there are other suspects out there that police have not properly investigated. The prosecution, on the other hand, closed by saying that there's no way to know where Kara was when she wasn't seen on surveillance video, but it can be reasonably inferred that she was disposing of evidence based on what we did see. They said that they don't need to entertain every wacky theory the defense brings forward because they know that they have their murderer right there in the courtroom. They said that we saw how stressed and panicked Kara was about her relationship a year before the murder, with all of those 911 calls and frantically telling them that Anna Marie threatened to take Brianna. Imagine how stressed and panicked Kara was after a year of continuing to deal with that same behavior. The prosecution argued that after fighting over text, the fights continued once Anna Marie got home. He said that the fight turned physical and at some point, Kara pushed Anna Marie down the stairs. As Anna Marie lie there motionless, covered in blood, Kara realized that if Anna Marie lived through this, she would press charges against Kara and she would be charged with assault and battery and Brianna would be taken away by DCF. So, she made the decision to go down those stairs and strangle Anna Marie to make sure that she died. According to the ME, it would have taken a total of four and a half minutes to kill Anna Marie. So, that is how long Kara had to contemplate what she was doing and to stop but she didn't stop. She continued until Anna Marie was dead. After the closing statements, the jury was sent off for deliberations, but four days passed without a verdict. The jury felt that yes, Kara probably did do this, but there were four of the 12 jurors who felt that the prosecution did not prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. They felt like there was still room for doubt. By March 13th, after four and a half days of deliberating, they came out and told the judge that they were deadlocked and that further deliberation would not help. The judge at this point declared a mistrial. Kara would go on to go through 
three additional trials. Not one more, not two more, but three more trials. Four total trials. After the first trial, she was denied bail and waited until early 2014 for her next trial. The only real thing that differed about this trial was that Mark, Anna Marie's friend, had testified. Like I said earlier, he didn't testify in the first trial, but he did testify in the second trial. But at the end of that second trial, the jury was once again deadlocked. After the second trial, she was released on a $150,000 bail. By September of 2016, Kara went on for her third trial. This time, the prosecution brought forward a man named David Guyanoli. I do apologize if I'm saying his name wrong, but he was a quality engineer at the company that produced the paint that was found at the scene. He said that based on his own experiments that he had done with the paint, he strongly believed that the paint found at the scene was deliberately poured and not spilled. He said that it could not have been poured more than four hours before the crime scene photos were taken, which was at 9 p.m. Again, Anna Marie's body was found at around 7 p.m., so that meant that the paint had to have been poured at 5 p.m. or later, so long after her estimated time of death. This also showed that she definitely was not walking down the stairs and just, you know, had paint in her arms and then dropped it and it spilled everywhere. Other than that, other than this testimony, as far as I have seen, the same points were brought forward for this third trial. And it seemed that this expert testimony really did show that someone killed Anna Marie earlier in the day and then came back and poured paint on her before calling 911. The only person who could have done that was Kara. So, based on all of the evidence presented at trial, Kara was actually found guilty of first-degree murder. Now, if you thought that this is where the case ended, maybe I misspoke by saying there was four trials and not three, you would be wrong. By March of 2018, Kara filed for an appeal. The defense team submitted a 47-page document which stated that one of the biggest reasons why Kara was convicted was because of the expert testimony from this paint engineer, which they believe should not have been allowed. They said that David's testimony was based on experiments that he conducted himself, not within a lab or using any sort of scientific method. It should not have been allowed. They said that these experiments should have been done under multiple spatial, temperature, and humidity conditions. In part, they stated, quote, David's experiments also did not take into account the surface upon which the paint was found, a dead body and concrete as opposed to a sealed chart. He also did not account and control for the disturbances in the paint caused by the defendant and the first responders. To the extent he considered temperature and humidity, he was dependent on the accuracy of their readings at the crime scene, which were not verified. So based on this, by 2021, the judge reviewed the appeal and he actually agreed. He said, quote, We agree that David lacked the necessary expertise to perform the paint analysis, and his testimony lacked the requisite reliability and therefore should not have been admitted. Moreover, because David's testimony was significant and likely swayed the jury's verdict, we conclude that the error was prejudicial, and therefore we vacate the judgment against the defendant. So, the conviction was vacated, and she was released. Then, about two years after her third trial was overturned, Kara returned to court for her fourth murder trial. Once again, this trial was very similar to the third trial, but this time, they did not call that paint expert to the stand. After two weeks of trial, this new jury was sent off for deliberations. After deliberations started, Apparently, the judge had to dismiss three jurors. It was not totally clear why the jurors were dismissed, but they had already been deliberating for two days when they were dismissed. So, three ultimate jurors replaced those jurors and deliberations resumed for an additional two days. Then, finally, after those two days, the jurors came back with their verdict. They came back and decided that they would convict Kara on a lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter instead of first-degree murder. While this conviction was read out loud, Kara stood there with a look of absolute disbelief. She genuinely could not believe that she was actually being convicted of this. What say you, Madam Four Person? Has the jury agreed upon its verdict in Hampshire County Indictment 1180 CR 0128, the Commonwealth versus Kara Mantala? We have. 
If you could please give your verdict slips to the court officer. What say you, Madam Four Person, as to count one of Hampshire County indictment charging the defendant, Kara Rintala, with murder? Is she not guilty, guilty of murder in the first degree, guilty of murder in the second degree, or guilty of voluntary manslaughter? We, the jury, unanimously find the defendant, defendant guilty of voluntary manslaughter. Members of the jury, hearken to your verdict as the court will record it. You, upon your oaths, do say that the defendant, Kara Rintala, is guilty of voluntary manslaughter. This is the unanimous verdict of the jury, so say you, Madam Foreperson. So say you, all members of the jury. Yes. Yes. Judge, may the jurors be individually polled. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do um, when it comes time to sentence the defendant. Uh, I understand that um, she's been out for some time um, and was facing a more serious charge than the one that she's just been, um, or of which she's just been convicted, but she stands convicted at this point, so uh, I'm going to revoke her bail. Is the defendant's request? I'm sorry, Judge. Can I just have a minute? Sure. I understand. I understand. Yeah, the afternoon would be better. One week or two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. I'm going to go back and speak to the jury, but I, I just want to say um, to the lawyers uh, that it's been my pleasure to preside over um, such a well-tried case. Um, your dedication to this case and your craft was, was evident to me, uh, and I'm grateful for it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Voluntary manslaughter carries a max sentence of 20 years behind bars. We don't know the sentencing yet, as it is set to take place a few weeks from the time that I'm recording this. As I say in any video with a loose end like this, I will update you all as soon as I hear what the sentencing is. So, that is all of the information that I have on today's case. The fact that this woman went through four trials is literally unheard of. When I saw how many trials she went through, I knew that I had to cover this case because I wanted to see why. And I think I definitely can after seeing this information. I think for most people, it is kind of obvious that Kara did this, but the evidence just was not there. I can definitely see how juries would have a hard time convicting her in those first two trials. And the fact that she did get convicted in the third, but it was overturned, is bananas to me. It's, it's crazy. The way this whole thing played out was unbelievable, and what's even crazier is how she was let out on bail between the second and third trials. So, even though she was found guilty, she spent several years out free because jurors just could not make up their minds. I think the charge of voluntary manslaughter is very fitting here. I think it is a fair verdict given the lack of information that we have. I am also surprised that the prosecution kept going for first-degree murder even though they had so many hung juries. You would think that after the first or second trial that they would change the charge, but they didn't. I would have probably gone with second-degree murder if I were them and had all of these hung juries, but I guess in the end, it didn't matter because she was convicted of something and hopefully now she will stay behind bars. I think it's very clear that these two women had a very toxic relationship on both sides. I don't necessarily think that there was one clear aggressor here, I just think that they were two very different people who both had immature and inappropriate reactions to things that just did not warrant the kinds of arguments that they were having. I do think that Kara killed Anna Marie, but I do agree that this case was very hard to convict because they just did not have all of the information that they needed. But yeah, she is behind bars. She is facing a max of 20 years behind bars. This is a very recent trial, so we don't have the sentence yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was even more twists and turns in this case in the coming months or years. And of course, with anything I find out, I will let you all know. But that is where I'm going to end today's video, and now I want to know what you all think. 
do you think that Kara is guilty? Do you think that she got the appropriate sentence and verdict? Or do you think she should have gotten first degree murder? What do you think of those four trials? Do you think that the expert testimony was enough to vacate her conviction after the third trial? Do you think that the evidence they had was solid in general? Or do you think it was a weak case? Do you think she should have been convicted on anything at all, given the evidence that we do have? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok account. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.